Uh, I hope you don't mind, Tanya, a few more minutes since uh, more people have been joining. Uh, so we'll uh, wait for one or two minutes more. Don't worry. Take your time. I'm here. Thank you. Thank it's you. fine. Uh. 
a uh, very good morning to everyone i welcome you all to the last day of the five day webinar series on communities and food systems land labor migration jointly organized by the department of economics and geography in collaboration with the iqac selection college siliguri i would like to welcome our patron and chairman of the iqac father george thatathil who is also the principal of the Salesian College. I would also like to welcome Father Ajju Kurian, Vice Principal of Science and Coordinator of the IQAC, Salesian College, Siliguri. And Father George Champaka Tinal, Vice Principal of Humanities, Salesian College, Siliguri. I would, with all my heart, want to welcome Dr. Tanya Martinez, postdoctoral researcher at Greenwich University, who is going to deliver a talk on indigenous food systems in Mexico and resilience during the times of crisis. As I already mentioned, we are today on the last day of our webinar, so I will just take a moment to reflect on my experience through, the, through this past four days. The idea of a joint webinar occurred to us based on our realization that the research areas and agendas of the two disciplines have mostly been intertwined mainly in the Himalayan region. So we tried to materialize the idea and tried bringing together some established resource persons specializing in their respective research areas. In the first day, we had Professor Pranam Kanti Basu who discussed how a man through the history transformed transformed from the owner of the means of production to a labor who could think and create and further to a labor who could just do a specified, a specified work he was trained for. The transformation occurred through the agrarian and industrial revolution. He expressed how modernity had changed the definition of community and alienated people from the essence of humanism. On the second day, we had Professor Sanchari Roy Mukherjee, who discussed an issue that is living among us at the moment, quite visibly and quite closely, the plight of migrant workers during the pandemic. She stressed on how the pandemic has brought significant damage to the lives of the migrant laborers and also reflected some possible remedies to ease their situation. On the third day, Dr. Sohel Firtos gave a talk on our conventional land use system uh, and how it is putting our food sovereignty to jeopardy. He discussed how an immediate intervention or transition was needed to prevent the same and he also prescribed some possible transition measures that could be adopted. On the fourth day, we had Dr. Aaron K Kingsbury who gave a presentation on the rural-urban transition derived from his case study and research of a village in Japan. All these resource persons belong to different disciplines and different areas of research. Still, all their lectures were, more than a, uh, were in more than a way interlinked to each other and one could visibly trace the linkages. All these lectures find a common base in the term land. All the topics, whether it was about communities, labor, migration, land use system, rural urban transition, they all originate and flow through one factor that is land. And if seen in a way, all the sessions can be distinctly found to be interconnected to one another. The terms land, labor and migration are inseparable and they do, and they do have a direct or indirect effect on land use system and rural urban transition. In today's session as well, Dr. Tania Martinez is going to talk about indigenous food systems in Mexico, which again, if seen through a lens, can be associated with land. Talking about indigenous food systems, many of us may ourselves be familiar to how the farming families at the rural villages tend to stick to their conventional farming practices that are derived from their ancestral knowledge and how any small or big technical change finds its place very slowly into the practice or never finds it, its place at all. Uh, I hope Dr. Tanya Martinez will shed a broader light to the topic and through her experience and through her research, 
uh, on this topic uh, in context to Mexico, uh, and I welcome her again with all my heart. I thank her for accepting our invitation in just one request and uh, agreeing to give a talk on such a meaningful topic that could be relate, uh, relatable to all of us who dwell around or who have been to rural places or who have our research interests that is placed in rural areas and farming villages. So with, uh, with this much, I would li uh, like to request Father Principal George Tatathil to kindly uh, give us a few words of encouragement and please address the session. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Biki. Uh, welcome, Tania. Uh, could I know, uh, just for a start, whether you are in Greenwich University place or you are right now in your home place in uh, Puebla? I'm in Mexico, Oaxaca. Eight, okay, seconds. great. Great. Como esta? Bien, gracias. <laughs> okay. Muchas gracias. Muy bien. Uh, so, uh, Having said that, I liked the way uh, Vicky started off this morning. Uh, regret me joining a few seconds, few minutes late uh, due to a government uh, program on uh, rural um, switch the plan uh, that's going on right now on another platform. Uh, I liked the way uh, Vicky placed the uh, lecture of today in context, connecting with the previous lectures. And I guess all of us who listen to these past lectures would have our own way of connecting uh, and um, uh, preparing ourselves in a way to listen to uh, Martinez. Uh, let me say that for me, in all of these talks, the one word that stood out prominent was the word community. You know, uh, wherever we are, uh, when, it, when we talk about uh, land and food systems, when we talk about alienation or modernity, if we, uh, we are actually seeing how these issues are impacting, especially in these times, uh, one or the other communities. And Vicky mentioned that here we are located in the sub-Himalayan region, uh, and uh, there Martinez is in Mexico. You know, I have been to Mexico City, passing through, through to Panama and to uh, through your Copa airline uh, to uh, Bolivia and onward to uh, Santiago de Chile. So, you know, landing in Mexico City, landing in Panama, one gets a feel of how it is in uh, Central America. And, uh, you know, the tropics in a way connect. And I think the difference between Northern America or Canada, which is closer to the pole, and where Martinez is located and we here is on the one side the closeness or proximity to what we call as the tropical climate or tropical cultures. Of course, having said that, we in India, we are quite far away from, let's say, the Central American cultural context. And that for those from social science field and those who have read the 100 years of solitude of uh, uh, Gabriel uh, Garcia, uh, you know, you will see how cultures are so different. The mythologies are so different from where we have grown up with Ramayana and uh, Mahabharat, kind of, you know, the Indic culture and uh, South American culture. So I think uh, the culture is impacting or communities give rise in a way to cultures or cultures are preserved in and through communities and the environment and the geographical context uh, in a way gives rise to different cultures, you know, so uh, how this particular uh, issue is impacting in Mexico, just like we listened yesterday to Japan, I think this uh, two talks in, in particular places the other three talks uh, of uh, Sanjari Roy and uh, Kandi Basu, you know, and Sohel Firdos looking at the issue from closer home to us. And I think this is what I would like to appreciate, the way in which the organizers of this seminar positioned these papers and these uh, uh, talks. And I'm sure all of us um, joining in and listening will definitely have our own take on putting these topics together. And I wish and I hope that more of such kind of a conclusionary 
discussion also emerges post listening to uh, uh, Tania Martinez. With these few words, and uh, once again, warm welcome to Tania and all of you, my dear participants from across wherever you are, to this uh, national webinar series of Economics and Geography Departments of Salishan College, uh, Siliguri Campus. Um, I hand over to you, and once again, I'm glad to be part of it. Thank you. Thank you, Father, for your valuable words. Uh, I would also take some time to welcome uh, Professor Sanchari Roy Mukherjee, who just joined us and who was one of our valuable speakers who uh, gave her lecture two days ago, and we quite enjoyed it as well. Uh, welcome, ma'am. Now I would like to welcome Dr. Bipul Chetri to introduce our speaker for today. Thank you, Vicky, sir. Good morning to one and all. It's my honor to introduce our speaker, Dr. Tanya Martinez, to all of us here today. Dr. Tanya Elulia Martinez Cruz, a water management specialist and postdoctoral researcher at the University of Greenwich, UK, working on nutrition, gender, and indigenous food systems in the Peruvian Amazon. She is a Mexi, that is, indigenous woman who was born in Oaxaca, Mexico. She received her BSc in Irrigation Engineering from Chapingo Autonomous University in 2009, and MSc in Agriculture and Biosystem Engineering from the University of Arizona in 2012, and a PhD in Social Science from Wageningen University in 2020. Early in her career, she worked in Sanitary Engineering, Water Management, Biofuels Production, ICT, D, Irrigation Technology, and Agricultural Extension in Mexico. Since 2006, she has been working in international development projects, collaborating with institutions like the International Maize and Wheat Improvement Center, Value for Women, and Global Landscape Forum, and different other projects worldwide. Her research interest includes politics of knowledge and research in technology-driven intervention, gender and social exclusion or inclusion, climate action, nutrition and traditional food system. She is also a social activist promoting the conservation of native seeds and indigenous knowledge as a key to biocultural diversity in indigenous people to tackle the global challenges. She spoke about the issues at Global Landscape Forum, that is Restore the Earth, held at UN headquarters, New York, born in 2019 and 2020. The first high-level expert seminar on indigenous food system at Food and Agricultural Organization in Rome in 2018, and among others. She also does advocacy work on the right to education for minority groups and women in STEM. On January 1st, 2020, she also received her Bastan de Mando, a prestigious symbolic wooden can used to confer authority in some indigenous communities to fulfill a year of community service as a secretary of women's office in her hometown at Tamazula Palm de Espirito Santo. During her one year term, she will be supporting the women's office in the issues related to the welfare of women in her community. With so much of work experience and academic credibility, today we have Dr. Tanya Martinez with us. Entire Salation College, welcome you, ma'am. Thank you. Over to you, Vicky. Sir. Thank you. So thank you very much. I wasn't sure if a, the Master of Ceremonies was going to say something or not. Um, no, but it's my honor to be here. And thanks. thank you also for the wonderful presentation, introduction. We can't hear you. I think you are muted. Okay, uh, I'm sorry I was muted. Uh, thank you, Martina. Uh, uh, Dr. Bipul, for such a uh, detailed introduction of Dr. Tania. And I would now like to request Dr. Tania to take over the session and uh, deliver the talk for today. Thank you. Very much. Um, yeah, well, let's 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 go to the presentation. 
Let's see. I, I, you have to excuse me a bit because this is the first time I'm going to present with Google Talks. So I, I'm also learning to navigate with all, all, all these platforms. Um, so let me see how this goes. Um, oh, let's see. Just let me know if you can see my screen and if everything seems to be okay. Yeah, so, it's coming. It's coming. Thank you. So, um, the, the way I'm going to tell you this story today, I, 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 I like telling people that I tell stories more like a grandmother because I like giving details. And I know this is a scientific academic research, but I do share a lot. I'm, I'm an anthropologist. I could, I could call myself now, I'm an anthropologist. So I share stories more in, in a different language rather than specifically scientific. So if, uh, I hope I don't bore you too much. <laughs> uh, not at all. Tania, if you are taking that storyline, I think uh, there is a bit of the story to be completed by uh, by Biki or Bipul telling us how they landed on you in Ma in Mexico, because that's part of the story too. Okay, that sounds perfect. Okay, so um, I call this presentation Indigenous Food Systems in Mexico in Resilience in Time of Crisis. But to be honest, I will speak specifically about one system, which is called a Milpa system. And the central element of this system, it's native maize. In Mexico, there are many, a, like there's a long oral tradition in different indigenous groups. We are 68 indigenous groups. And many of us link to maize in so many ways on how we came to this earth, for example. Um, so, but like a, the presenters mentioned before, I come from a technical background and this is how this story starts. Because when we go to school, usually there is like a dominant paradigm in a school that tells you when we do science, when we do research, we are doing this because we want to improve something. In my case, it was food security. In 2012, I joined this program that was called Masagro program, which stands for the sustainable modernization of the traditional agriculture in Mexico. How is that this program emerged? Well, Mexico, as I mentioned before, it depends or relies on maize. But ironically, even though we rely on maize, we were importing the 30% of maize and those numbers have been increasing the last years. There was a, tort a tortilla crisis, tortilla made of maize in 2007. And since it's such a basic crop, people in the government was concerned. How is that it ha this happened? Well, we imported a lot of this maize from the US and they had this boom of the biofuels in the US and then the maize got super expensive. What also happened in Mexico is with all the climate change, we had droughts, rains, and we lost uh, several hectares of crops. And then the government was concerned. So they implemented this program which was led by the International a Maize and Wheat Improvement Center, which I think you are familiar with, because I know you consume high numbers of wheat, wheat sorry, and um, this center also deals with wheat. Okay. So I'm going to call myself naive, because even though I was raised in a little village, um, but when I joined it, Masagro program, I had gone to university, I had done already my master's, and I knew how to solve many of these global challenges, climate change and food security. So I went with a group of researchers to the mountains of Chiapas, a, which have a pretty similar landscape like my hometown. And you, you see here like a woman, and if you like see in the picture, um, we have the plants, the maize plants separated more or less at 1.5 meters from each other. One of my colleagues, a German colleague, asked me, well, if we are supposed to help Mexico to increase the food security, don't you think the answer is so easy with this system? This system seems to be so traditional. It's, it's not going to help to fulfill the goals of the project. My answer to him was pretty easy. I told him because it's a milpa. 
but I never really explained to him what I meant with a meal pacifist. So after he came back uh, from talking with farmers, he said to me, now I know what you mean when you say it is a milpa. A milpa is a system that gives them maize, beans, potatoes, and many other crops. It's an intercropped system. And that's what they use to fulfill their the dietary needs. So changing the native seeds by improved maize, doing monocropping was not going to work in this environment. What happens in Mexico, it's like, you know, a, the Green Revolution emerged in Mexico with Norman Borlaug. We have had this dominant paradigm of modernization which means basically we have a looked at agriculture that we need to produce more of maize, specifically in the case of Mexico, per unit of land, water, fertilizer, etc. And most of the policies that we also have designed for many, many years have attempted to convert the traditional farming into modern farming. And if a farmers cannot like compete in the market because it also has been a market-oriented paradigm, um, the government expected them to turn into different activities. When I, after this experience that I mentioned in Chiapas, I started to question myself, how is that I, having been raised in a community where we also valued all these milpa systems, suddenly I wanted also to convert most of the traditional agriculture and I was buying all this dominant narrative. So that's when I decided to get into a PhD in social science and change my whole background, trying to understand why, why was people keeping those systems. So um, as I mentioned before, like maize, it's a central element for us. And most of the programs have promoted a hybrid maze, aligning also with the neoliberal project. But why is that many farmers then cultivating native maize, these traditional systems are still existing up to date? Something that I didn't like also when I was like trying to understand all these dynamics was like some conflict some people advocating to say we need to preserve or native seeds or native systems but at the same time essentializing this idea of the novel savage the indigenous community shouldn't be perverted by the processes of globalization but at the same time other people saying these novel savages or these indigenous peoples do not know what's the best way we need to teach them better ways so to me, there seemed to be a dichotomy on what it is indigenous and traditional, like they, sorry, indigenous and modern, like they were supposed to be apart and never touch. Recently, we have many scholars that have said that one of the reasons why people or indigenous communities have survived better is because they've learned to hybridize and combine different elements but it still doesn't seem like a dominant approach in agricultural development and research. And more or less, that's my position. But trying to understand why is that this native maize cultivation coexisted over time, despite all these policies that seem to be threatening them, I started to uh, focus on a field that we call social studies of technology and technography, which we say, according to Paul Richards, that it's the ethnography of a technology, which means that each technology has a social component and it's adapted to a context and has different meanings in time for different people. For example, whereas for my grandmother, the seeds could be like her children that were passed from one generation to other and linked to resilience for a um, plant genetist would be a an improved seed that would be um, resistant to some diseases so what i wanted to do now was then to study how is that maize 
cultivation has coexisted over the time. And for that, I took the case of one community in Oaxaca, Mexico, which is called Santa Maria Yavesia. The work I'm going to present you, it's so much ethnographic, so I'm going to be too descriptive in, descriptive in some cases. So I hope, again, like this doesn't bother you. Um, and this is the context. This is this tiny village in the mountains with 500 people, more or less, less than 500 people. And they have the pretty system. Now I'm going to describe you what, what a milpa system is. So we don't have like a standard definition of milpa because, again, it's going to be adapted to different landscapes, altitudes, dry, rainy environments, etc. But that's something that the farming has shaped over the time according to the climatic conditions and that he has used or she has used to fulfill their dietary needs, but also is linked to culture. This system might seem pretty simple, but it's more complex than that. I will explain this a bit further, but for example, tricky elements are the maize, beans, and uh, pumpkins. Beans, because they fix nitrogen, so imagine how interesting is the traditional knowledge, but also pumpkins and many other plants that you see there also help with the erosion. So it seems like a primitive system, so when people or these modern scientists say we need to teach them how to do better farming what do they actually mean is it like these farmers didn't know how to manage or those systems or how to manage the environment so first i'm going to start with some cultural elements of how we are linked to maize in javesia but also in many other indigenous communities and why these systems have preserved the first one has to be with food diversity. We have from this vegetable pier, which we call chayote in Spanish. I had to look for that name because I only have heard it in Spanish. We also have the potatoes, maize, pumpkins, beans. And what this allows us is to have a constant food through the year. When you don't have a, the corn mature yet, you could like take the, grain, the, the green a maize and make some atole, which is like a beverage. You could make tortillas with that a green or not mature corn, and that provides you food. With all the plants that you find in the milpa, you could also like make soups, and that gives you a variety and nutritious diet. Um, more food, which is basically uh, with many other things that you also find in these systems. So imagine, I've just showed you um, like few images of food, but it's said that you could make, I think 600 different dishes just with um, different elements and crops that you find in a meal pack. Can you imagine that diversity? Well, I think you can imagine because I know that in the, the food from India, it's really tasty and your country is also so a diverse and bright. Uh, but even when we think there's nothing in the field because everything seems to be dry, you find those roots. And that's specifically in February, March, and April. Even when you don't see milpa or maize in the upper part, you will find food underground, which is also amazing, right? How those systems and how all this knowledge can help people to have a constant a food source. But are there other reasons why farmers keep their seeds? Or it's just like because we need food and that's the only things they can, those systems can provide us? Well, the answer for me, it's more complex and let's explore that. Um, I want to start with a, the idea of development because I think in development there, are, there has also been like a mainstream narrative of what development should be and how we should be aiming for our societies or communities to look like. And there are many other alternatives that people have defined. For example, Arturo Escobar has mentioned this idea of pluriverses to refer to different worlds and how it would be ideal that all these different worlds and the rationals could coexist. One of the most famous ones is the Wembivir from the Andes in, in, in South America. But in the case of Oaxaca, 
not all Mexico, but just my home state, we have something that we call comunalidad. And it's a concept that I linked to MILPA as I was studying this or learning more about this MILPA system in this community. So it said that the, the comunalidad has four principles and the main definition comes from making things together. One basic element is the social fabric and the collective work. I heard that in the previous session you have touched on this issue, on, on, on the importance of, of doing things as a collective. And for these farmers, the collectivity is an element that allows them surviving. So what they do is like when they um, are going to farm, I know my friend Rinchu is in this seminar, so I'm going to call her name now. Let's imagine Tania Rinchu, and I'm going to name my ex-housemate, which was also ex-housemate of Rinchu by Shali. Um, we, we each one have milpa fields. On day A, we're going to crop my fields. On day two, we're going to crop a Rinchu's field. And then on the third day, we're going to crop by Shali's field. There's no money exchange, but more like this reciprocity and the idea that we have to do things together because that's like a survival strategy but also um as we work in the field um we are reinforcing other structures for example in this picture you only see men because all the women that are also joining this techio when they are cultivating are preparing a meal but I will explain that in, in the next slide. So here, for example, this picture seems simple, but you can see four different families there. You wouldn't believe that, but four different families are interacting in this picture on maize cultivation. It's also about celebration of life. Farmers believe grains are, are sacred, and that's one of the reasons they have inherited them from their parents and they will pass those seeds to the next generations. But it's also about adaptation, and I will explain that in another sl slide later. So when they are about to sow the, the fields, what they do is they keep this upper part, and that's something they eat before the whole a, Plant before sowing, because that's you. Those are like the smaller grains, and probably that some people would say no, we shouldn't eat them. But those farmers do not waste food because they believe food is sacred, and you shouldn't be wasting it. So they make a meal, and when they make this meal, they share it with all the people that has come to help. In this case, I would be sharing this meal with Vaishali and with Rinch. So I'm mixing celebration of life, social fabric, and cooperation, just in one single thing. Something that amazed me when I went to see those rituals is that a, none of the farmers or like the hosting family was not offering tortillas. Each farmer had to bring the, like his own tortillas. And I asked it why, and they told me because that's also another way to exchange seeds because we love, we are a culture that enjoys eating. So I would try Rinch's tortillas and Baishali's tortillas, and just based on what the taste is, the colors, we would decide that maybe I want to get some of the seeds, and they would also ask me some of my seeds. Something I forgot to say here is like, uh, they say that they might not eat meat every single day, but, when they used to come to the field, they would eat the best food ever. So everyone wanted to go to the field because they knew they would have a delicious meal. Even before planting, uh, they would offer a sip of any alcoholic beverage to the Mother Earth also to praise it and to ask Mother Earth for a, a fruitful harvest. So like there are many elements that seem to be simple when we just see a milpa field, but there are more complex elements of sharing, of celebration of life, of taking care of the environment because we don't want to like waste food, for example, food is sacred. Um, and then we see many other like rituals linked to maize. For example, in August a, the 1st, 
which is not only celebrated in Mexico, but also in many um, countries in Latin America. And I would like to hear maybe if in India you have something. Um, because we praise that August is the, is the month where it rains the least, but also when farmers are not getting or are not having sufficient maize uh, stored anymore, but they already have cropped the fields and they ask Mother Earth uh, to please allow a fruitful harvest for this year because they need to have sufficient maize uh, for the whole next uh, year. They also have many rituals uh, that are about sharing food, for example, when you are going to get married, when there's a newborn, we eat in this plate, for example. Um, it's basically tortillas with a lot of sauce. The, the things that you get uh, or you use for this sauce are also things you get from your milpa field. We say, or tradition says, that you need to um, take one piece of this tortilla, which is basically a tortilla, this dish, with a lot of sauce, because if you don't have any sauce on your piece of tortilla, you might not, not have hair. And also, um, if you are getting married, then you are not wishing the best for that couple. So there are many other <laughs> beliefs and things linked to, to what we eat and, and what we do. Like this is just when we go to our sacred places, a lot of the figures we make to go to these sacred places are made with maize. And this is just like to show you that. This is for a wedding. For community service, like a, a, the master of ceremonies mentioned for my introduction, um, we also have to go to many sacred places and we have to make many of these offers with maize figures. The reading of maize, which is linked to our cosmovision, the alignment of energies when you are sick, when you get something, let's say I graduated from university or I just got a car, I have to go and ask the maze how I can praise Mother Earth for allowing me or blessing me with so many things. And maze, it's the, 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 the thing that we use in doing so. I saw that myself because my grandmother used to read maze, for example. And here, for I, I didn't mention this element, I mentioned four different elements for Comunalidad, but I think one of the most important ones, it's linked to territory. Why territory becomes so important? Because I always define it like the place where I could reinvent my own rules, where my right to self-determination, if the state respects it, will allow me to recreate the world in my own terms. Yes, we will be impacted by globalization, but we will have more room to decide the way we want to um, live. And that's, at least in the case of Oaxaca, many of the indigenous communities can claim a ownership and um, the right to do and govern themselves as they want without the interference of a political parties because they have the right to this territory and to enact the right to self-determination. And this is interesting also because uh, now that I'm mentioning um, Dukpa, my friend Rinchu, she wrote an interesting paper about a, how identity is reinforced with the making of a territory. So I think this plays out pretty well in many of these indigenous communities because they claim the ancestors' lands are their homes and they could enact or be or define in better terms who they want to be. So there's a story that they used to tell me really proudly. Um, they said that when the revolutionaries came to the region in 1910, most of the farmers took their guns and went to the borders because they didn't want the government to come in. And they say, we were ready to die for our territory and we would do it again. Because again, they say, if we can keep this territory, because it's also the home for our forest, the main um, element in the cosmovision is water, for example. If they can protect the territory, the borders, and not letting anyone to come in in the communities and grab their lands, their resources, 
they say they are also preserving life. So that's that's really interesting. And well, they love the collectivity. Again, you will see more than four families in just this one single picture. But then now that I have described some of the sociocultural elements about um, around milpa and maize cultivation, I would like to go and think why, well, first, has the milpa system changed over the time or is it a static? Just coming back to these dichotomies, um, we know why this uh, monocropping wouldn't work because we saw already many elements, but can we also agree that these systems should be kept, not touched, not pervert with this idea of the novel savage that many especially social activists have. I'm not criticizing that, but I think we should be more open to see also what are the strategies that people enact for survival. Well, it has changed, but it's been linked to the promises of thinking of a better life with poverty, but also with policies. Um, so we say in Mexico that there's like a bimodal way in which we make policy because uh, farmers that are not capable to link to market have been treated more or less like subjects of social development programs. They have no capacity to contribute to food security according to the rationale of the government. So we should maybe just give them assist, um, support them with uh, programs and probably push them to stop farming and maybe incorporating them into other activities, which sounds sort of perverse, but that's the way. I don't know if in India works that way, but I guess it also does, right? So what happened in this community is after the Second World War, um, a 30% of the men migrated to the US laborers were needed in the US and this community or men in this community engaged in many of these uh, programs and went to the US. This of course shaped the internal dynamics of the community. They also claim that have changing aspirations or according to what I saw, they also think of Yes, they want to be in their territories, they want to preserve many elements of the culture, but they also dream to do something different. I'm showing the picture of this couple because this woman used to tell me, my, my husband used to drink a lot and it took me a long time to decide that I also wanted to do something else than just taking care of my children. So those are the things that she does, all this art and she sells it now. And then she was just also telling me, we, we, we also change on our ideas of what we want to, de to, to do, where we want to be, we travel, and they also still farm. The, her husband goes six months to the US and comes back to the community for six months. Um, what also happened in the community is like when all these programs um, that wanted to convert or let's say, not support the traditional farming, the government implemented some stores that would supply basic foods to many of these communities because if farmers have something to eat because they can buy it in, in, in these stores, we can use them as laborers in other activities. That was the rationale of the market. But even when that happened, farmers never stopped completely farming, but they farmed less areas, less fields, but also that made them uh, be vulnerable under different circumstances and I will explain that also why. So I mentioned that farmers started to migrate um, approximately in 1940 and they started with this routine because they could migrate legally to the, to the US. They would have spent six months in Mexico and they would spend six months in the US. What they would do is like they would leave the fields cropped and the cropping season starts in March, April, they would leave by May and they would come back in November for the celebrations, different celebrations they have in the community, but also for the New Year's Eve. And that was a routine. As women, they were staying back at home. They had to take care of the children, the social structure, because if you wanted to plant more fields, you needed more labor. 
um, it was not possible for them to crop all the fields they had, but they would crop at least the necessary for some of the rituals they needed but they would also rely on these stores that the government had implemented. And everything was okay. They mentioned different climatic events and they said like they were, over, they were able to survive. Floods, a, heavy rains, they were okay. Pests, attacks, but they had so many a, fields that they could at least recover some of the, of, of the maize from, from, from some of these fields. If, some of them also failed. But what happened in the 2000 is like they, there was a hurricane in 2005. And they said, we survived. Uh, we lost some of our crops. We had to relocate some of our, our, our fields in higher lands because the river flooded all our lands. But we were OK. And we got maize from that uh, government store, which we called Conasupo. But then we had the tort tortilla crisis and the boom of biofuels and Mexico was importing 30% of maize. And when the U.S. said, sorry, guys, we're not going to sell you maize because we're using it for a bioethanol, then the Mexican government started to look for maize in other regions. And still that region or this community was OK. Then they had heavy droughts and, 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 and rains in 2009 and 2011. But something that really hit them badly was a Hurricane Matthew in 2010, because it basically destroyed the main entry or the only entry they had um, to the community coming from the city. So they say, we had money, but no food, because what happened is like all the government stores ran out of food from food. There was no maize. And then they said, we don't want this to happen to us again. Some farmers said that in order to survive, they had to go to upper lands with other farming communities and ask them to sell them maize. And they thought, if we don't have our supplies internally, we won't be able to survive. And that's then we're thinking about the value of being a self-sufficient, sovereign in a way food sovereign in a way. So this is when many changes in the MILPA came. So the MILPA, it's not a static um, system. It, has, it, it changes over the time because it needs to adapt to the needs of the farmers. And I describe this like the encounter of two worlds, because then I think modern science and traditional knowledge can coexist. So uh, here I'm showing you these women that it's farming. They are doing some participatory plant breeding. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with that term, but just let me put it um, in a general way with a silly example. So don't, think, don't, don't take my example seriously. Let's say um, I want to have a child with brown eyes because mine are black. So. What I'm going to do is try to find a guy that has those a, brown eyes and I'm going to try to marry him or have a child with him. So basically, what, that's what they do when they are doing participatory plant breeding, selecting some traits they like. Could be the height of the plant, could be the, the type of grain, could be something that lodges less or don't know. And they select that in the field. Farmers by nature, uh, know how to improve their systems. But there are other ways in which they can do it faster. And that's when all this participatory plant breeding comes. One of the limitations of participatory plant breeding or the conventional definition that uh, persisted for many years was that they only focused on one specific crop. In the case of Mexico, just on native maize. But as you saw, the system of farmers, it's not only about maize, has many other crops. So the combination here of this scientist that I'm showing you here, his name is Humberto Castro, and I think he does an amazing work. He understood that he needed to go beyond just the maize, and I will explain that in uh, some seconds. So I already mentioned this of the three sisters and the need of a coexistence in between corn, beans, and squash because beans add some of the fertilizer that the maize needs and also squash helps 
to lead with the erosion, right? So it seems like it's a silly and simple system, but no, there are many amazing things in just this system, right? Why is that people keep their seeds? Look at this maize. Doesn't it look so amazing? It, and it's a native variety. It's pretty long, 40 centimeters, more or less. Um, well, first, if they use their seeds, they don't need to buy seeds every single year. One of the criticisms with hybrid maize, it's like it can work if you reuse the seed maybe the first two or three years, but then after some years, you have to get new seeds. Basically makes you dependent and farmers have less, let's say space of maneuver, but if they use the own maize, they don't have to rely on the market. But also seeds are already adapted to specific soils. So for example, uh, the land usually, at least in this community, was inherited from the side of the man. And also when this, the guy or the, the man was getting a piece of land, he would also get some of the seeds. Because if I know that I have grown a specific, a specific type of maize in that piece of land, I also know I'm going to have, um, I, I'm, I'm going to ensure um, some crops for the next year and I don't have to rely and again, and I'm going to have something to feed my family. So it's about resilient, self-sufficient again. Um, but when all the migration happened, I, when I was describing you all this dynamic of uh, shaying, the sowing and these uh, different activities, farming activities, all those activities happen here. That, that's an upper altitude. And now most of the farmers live here. And now most of the farming takes place just in this area. Why? Well, because the techio was such a complex system, but also because women could not stay here. When the men started to migrate with the social norms, people said, how is that women are going to stay just by themselves here? So they need to come to the lower lands. They can be closer. And then they, if, if something happens, there's a better chance for them to help each other. And that's how all this milpa system started to change. These days, I think I only found that 20% of people are still farming in these upper lands and doing this techio thing. But less and less, it's happening these days. Also, the crop diversification. You would believe that a, the crops have increased no, sorry, you wouldn't believe that the crops have increased as, as a, this, the, the time has passed and that the, the explanation, it's again linked to how these farmers love innovating. So you see that they have more crops in the milpas now as they had before, but also uh, they have even more crops in the lower lands that they had in the upper lands. That all, that's also a trait of adaptation. In the lower lands, the, the, the whether it's a warmer and it allows for more plants to grow, whereas in the upper lands it's colder, but also you see in the milpas, they don't have so many blue maize anymore. They don't also have potatoes anymore, or they have, but not so many people crop them anymore because those are crops that are more adapted uh, to a higher altitude. And you see the, 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 the amazing thing about those systems, it's like crops are so adapted to some specific conditions. And that doesn't mean like they might not be able to grow potatoes in the lower lands, but that is going to take some time for them to adapt those seeds and those crops. Um, some of the other changes in the system, and that's when I like the story of Umberto Castro, the, the, the technician or the engineer that I portrayed as the modern science person was that when he came to the community, he told the farmers the same thing that my German said when I was describing this first a, episode. Um, well, if your problem farmers, it's you don't have enough maize anymore, let's make it easy. Let's, let's give you all the seeds. And the farmers explained, no, we don't want to change your seeds. We don't want to be buying seeds every year. We want to use your seeds. And also because with our own seeds, we make many many foods they tell you for example that they are totally like one of the drinks they make it can only be made with white maize 
some of the tortillas for some rituals they make only can be made with blue maize. So they were like, no, Umberto, don't even like try to, to, to change that. This is not going to happen. And then Umberto was like, okay, let's not change your seeds, but let's think of, again, uh, you want to increase the maize production? Well, let's, let's increase the plant density. Instead of cropping every 90 centimeters, why don't you do it every 20? Instead of putting five seeds like you do, well, why did they use to put five seeds in every hole? Because they wanted to ensure germination rate. They were not sure if, if all the plants were going to germinate. And Umberto told them, you need to do two every 20 centimeters, and that would be the ideal system. And then the farmers were like, no, 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 this is not going to happen because we not only eat maize, we need potatoes, we need or beans, we need other plants. And then Umberto was like, okay, let's keep your potatoes, let's keep your beans, and let's uh, do it, I don't know, every 40 centimeters. And then the farmers again were like, no, because imagine if I have to measure 40 centimeters every time I'm planting or I'm, I'm sowing my, my, my fields. I'm not going to finish, never. So then Umberto was like, okay, let's try to do another spacing. So most of the farmers now do a two or three seeds of maize instead of five. Um, they do every 60 centimeters, with it's, which is more or less the, the length of the steps, and it's easier to, ha to, to handle. Also, they used to have a, some a fruit trees in the system, like you see in this picture. I don't know if you, you can see my mouse. I hope you do. But this seems like a bit messy, right? Those are the fruit trees. But when they met also Umberto and other people, they started to organize the system in a better way because then they wanted to make a better use or a more efficient use of all the space. Even with all the um, beliefs they have, they, because they started, um, they need to migrate by May, the latest, to the US, most of the farmers. And they had a river that was crossing the whole community. And the old people used to say, water is sacred. So we cannot irrigate our cornfields. We need to rely on the rains. But the, uh, the, 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 rain, the rain patterns changed, and now they couldn't like really predict when they were going to be able to leave because it was not clear, right? So they decided to implement or to design some uh, irrigation systems along the community, and now they also use some uh, irrigation. The younger generations, they, they say like they had a whole discussion and a fight with the older generations, like saying, yes, but the water is sacred, you cannot do this. But also the younger generations were so sure that they wanted to, to, to migrate, but also come because they could make an income. Um, but they also needed the maize fields because of this ex experience that happened in 2011. So it was an interesting negotiation process, and now they have irrigated a, well, they, 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 they feel so proud about their, about their irrigation systems, but it's not so technified. But basically what they do is they have some pipes and they can take some water and that helps, but they feel proud of it. And I think it's interesting. They also change the crop patterns, for example. Now they also have introduced some flowers that they can sell in the market. That's a farmer like just being really proud of this extra money income he can make with the flowers. Um, this is just a farmer, a farmer showing me how they select um, the maize in the field, they, like what he needs to do if he doesn't want some specific traits from the from from one plant or if he wants some specific traits, right? They also have learned to use some post-harvest post techniques, for example. Now they store, even they use, like you see, a Coca-Cola bottle here, because what they do is like they store the maize in smaller containers, so it doesn't get affected by any worm or any other a, insect. And they just like take what they need as, they, as the year goes or unfolds. So some of the other changes has been the crop density, crop patterns. They also use mycorrhizas now, which is basically a fungus they use to improve the rooting system so the, 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 the plants don't follow, don't fall so much. 
they also use organic fertilizers now something they they've learned to do and i think something interesting in the community is like they say they love the cleaning the the the, the um yeah they they call we like to know that what we eat it's clean so that's why they are trying to go back to to more the organic environmentally friendly production they said for some years they used um, chemical fertilizers but that also came from the government because the government told them if you use fertilizers it's like a giving vitamins to your children your plants are going to grow more but when with Umberto Castro, this engineer came to the community, he explained to them that you cannot give to the soil or to the plant something if you're not sure it really needs. Maybe you're, um, let's say, causing harm if you are adding something that your soil doesn't need. So they, they are like more aware now that they need to be more conscious and careful on what they receive and need to question a bit more first a bit more when they get any of these uh, things from the government they also developed a seed bank because one of the worst experiences they had was like having to go to the neighboring community to ask them for may seeds because they didn't have sufficient seeds anymore and they say they didn't want to pass for that again and they said we need to have our own seed bank so well, we see that farmers are part-time uh, migrants, but also farmers. So this farmer that I'm showing you here, it's known as being the best farmer because a, he has a um, maize of all the colors, blue, red, yellow, a white. And also he tells you that he has included so many, many crops in his fields that everyone looks at him and says like he's the best farmer just because he has such a diverse meal. And now, even with the COVID, uh, coming back to the point of uh, self-determination, I was talking to this granny a couple of weeks ago and I, I was asking her, how are you doing? Because you are completely locked down. The lockdown probably in India it's pretty similar. In rural communities, it doesn't work in individual basis. In the cities, it works. More or less, it works. But in the communities, when you are so used to doing so many things collectively and sharing, how do you tell someone to not go out from their houses? So what this community and many other communities in Mexico have done, it's to enact their right to self-determination um, on their territories and have decided to do a collective lockdown, which means they are not letting people that do not live in the communities to come uh, because they could be the vectors for the COVID to spread. So this granny was telling me that her son lives in another community um, and he cannot come because he could be bringing the disease, but also that she has some sisters living in the city and they cannot come and visit her because, again, the danger that they could represent for the community. And then I was telling her, so how are you dealing with all this? And then she was like, don't worry, I'm doing OK. My neighbors come and take care of me. I have food. I am luckily, they, she said, we have many fruits here, so I, I'm, I'm managing quite well. We have things to eat, and that's the most important. With food, we can resist this. Um, and up to August 10, I haven't checked the statistics yet, but in Mexico we have something that we call the municipalities of hope. Uh, and those municipalities of hope are in regions in Mexico where no COVID cases have been present, and that community is one of them. So like the power of this territory, again, the, the right to self-determination and to decide in, to be also like food um, self-sufficient, it's so important for survival. So I also like it, those uh, farmers, because those stopped farm, those farmers stopped farming for one year. And when you ask them, have you ever stopped farming? The guy doesn't want to tell you. He's more like gossiping and saying just only once, like not wanting that people know that he did it and like sort of feeling ashamed. And those are also some of the best farmers. But I just love the way they don't want to talk so openly about stopping farming because it 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 seems like 
you you must be a bit silly if you stop farming because it's threatening your own life and survival and just nearly to finish there's also people that has never left the community and i was asking this guy this is one of the the, the, the persons that never left the community why you don't leave if it's so easy for your people to go to the us with papers to work to make some extra money he was like why do i need to leave i like being my own boss i have food here i have my land i have my family i have my maze i am free i even have my my donkey niño little kid who i who i love walking um so why should i leave what it's interesting about his expression is like when we went for the first time to visit him, he was living in one tiny house that usually we would link to poverty. And then we started to question ourselves after like putting him in front and saying for me, the most important it's my freedom. So who is actually poor? Someone that cannot like enact this freedom or someone that has no money i think it depends right so that's when i believe like we need to question many of these dominant paradigms right that we have imposed so uh, nearly to conclude um what is interesting about all this work is like we see that many of these development modernizing paradigms have imposed in many communities and indigenous communities represent, or indigenous people represent the 6% of the population. They are also some of the poorest ones, uh, but they preserve the 80% of the biodiversity that we have around the world and live in the 25% of the land in the world. Then one of the things is like, isn't it ironic that when they seem to preserve a lot of knowledge, uh, biodiversity, in such a small space, why is that they are considered or they are some of the poorest and they are um, suffering this inequality? Well, we say that one of the main dangers to many of these communities are the land grabbings and the policies that have reinforced those inequalities. Some statistics say that every, sec every seven seconds we are losing a forest of the size of a soccer field. Can you imagine that? And that's the home of many of these indigenous peoples. And we have seen, or at least I try to convey to the story, that the territory is so important for their own coexistence, in their coexistence also in their own terms. And again, like they do not fit um, necessarily this modernization paradigm totally, but also nor this traditional. They need to um, readjust their living strategies and their territory becomes so essential in enacting is this right to self-determination and the right to be what they want to be. I think I want to conclude just like saying that in our, um, agricultural development practice we should be more open to see these other rationals um, and understand what are also the aspirations of peoples not everything has to be about the market not everything has to be about modernizing in the ways we think it should be modernized and maybe we should learn to listen a bit more and see what other alternatives the communities can also offer us and then that's it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tanya. That was such a wonderful session we had. Uh, now, as as per our schedule, we will go on to a few questions from the participants, and then we'll look to conclude. Uh, let me pick uh, some questions for you. If you cannot see it on the screen, I'm reading it out for you. And the first question is from Prova Kujur. Collective, collective farming seems to disappear these days at the uh, same time present generation prefer to have either secondary or tertiary sources of livelihood. In this context, 
can you please throw some light on the issues of sustainability of farming system can you repeat the last part sorry uh in in the same context can you please throw some light on the issue of sustainability of farming system yeah that's an interesting question i think well i will i would talk from food sovereignty and i think what many people when they are speaking about food sovereignty it's more a one is linked to the right to self-determination like this modernizing paradigm, I think maybe I didn't. I, yeah, I don't think I mentioned that. The, the the modernization paradigm has also relied a lot on high inputs, and that also has been detrimental to the environment. And yeah, so I think I I, I would. I'm not sure if I could say that we could with just the small farming be self sufficient entirely. But I think definitely we could find better ways to do um, agriculture to feed the world, right? Because that has been like the, the, the approach that we, I think we failed on that because we have thought on increasing productivity and modernization as the only way to supply or to, to feed the world. But I think we have undermined many of the local uh, alternatives now that I was mentioning just the local, when I go to the communities here in Oaxaca, especially the ones in rural areas are the ones that are being more resilient with the COVID. They are not running out of food. They have something to eat. Whereas in the cities, people, it's more prone to a, have problems because they need to rely and buy food all the time. So, uh yeah, I think we need to find alternative ways. Uh, next question is from Saptarshi Chakraborty. He asks, following this case study, how can we differentiate between self-reliance on food and food sovereignty or at a regional level? Mm, self-reliance on food and food sovereignty. Could you elaborate more a bit on what do you mean by self-reliance? Because I'm not so familiar with the context. If that person could elaborate, okay, then I could we, go back to the, uh, to, we, to the question. We can leave to him to continue with his question. Uh, we can go uh, move on to another question, meanwhile. Uh, yeah, sure. Is the indigenous farming system in Mexico uh, conventionalized, or is it based on organic system of farming? I don't like putting labels so much into, into the practices they do because I think putting labels also is one of the problems. And let me explain a bit why. Mm, when I was mentioning many of these a movement, social movements advocating for a native maize, they, yeah, they say they, they have the milpas or the maize produced organically. And I mentioned they were using fer chemi chemical fertilizer at one point. I wouldn't tell or, or I wouldn't disregard that as a traditional farming. For one or other reason, those inputs came to be. I'm not saying they were right or they were wrong. I'm just saying they are part of the systems and that's part of the coping strategies. Um, what I would say, it's like, again, like coming back to, 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 to the right of self-determination, it could be nice that instead of promoting something that you don't know fits the rationals, you could also consult the people on the ways they want to be intervened or helped to be developed. Because that I think that's where we have also failed. Because you come and prescribe solutions without really knowing if that's something that fits that area or that rationale or that place. Um, so yes, they definitely uh, have better ways to deal in a more friendly way with the environment but i wouldn't call i don't know i i wouldn't i wouldn't say organic entirely and also because i don't want to call it an issue with organic agriculture but in mexico if we want to label something as organic usually it's more expensive too and yeah if you want like the real certificate this is organic and then it comes also to be a problem because who can access and spend more time 
getting no more time, more money in, in getting that food that has this certification. That doesn't mean there's not people producing, in, again, like I mentioned in this, a friendly ways with environment or using less inputs. But I think we have to be careful when we use those labels. Um, I don't know, maybe we can go to other question because I'm not sure where the moderator went. Uh, let's see. There is another question from Sneha Lata. Uh, how do people encourage the younger generation for primary activity? Mm. Yeah, that's... That's interesting. I think the, the only community I've seen in, in, in the region of in my home state that wanting to go back to farming because one of the realities that we are facing around the world, it's like where farmers are older, are getting old. But in this community, I think after they felt threatened, many of the younger people in that community are studying agricultural engineering because they want to be agronomists. They want to improve not only the farming, but also all the uh, agricultural activities they have in the community. So I think what has happened also been with the government, we linked with all the policies for many years that doing agricultural activities was something old fashioned and linked to poverty. So if you wanted to be not so poor, you, you needed to be away from agriculture. But in the end, we say, for example, that once in a while you need a doctor, once in a while you need to go to the dentist, but you every single day need to eat, right? So why we have undermined the value of, of, of farming when we all need to eat every single day? So I think there has to be something at an upper level. We need to change these rationals, but I would link that again with the modernizing idea because we thought that the only way to make farming was this intensive agriculture, right? And that's what promoted the government. We want a farmers, I'm not saying that I'm against the linkage to market. That's not what I'm saying. I don't want that to be misunderstood. But I wanna say it's like not necessarily when I was portraying this example of this farmer uh, that didn't wanna leave the community because he valued the, 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 the idea of being independent, the, the idea of being his own boss I think we have failed in that and I think we should push also for policies that sort of contra or like contrast effect of, of this mainstream way of understanding development. Also, I would think I'm, I'm just coming with another example because now I'm working on nutrition and it's interesting to see how also um, relying less in many of these uh, traditional systems, at least for indigenous communities, have also made them more, more vulnerable to many diseases. And when we think of COVID these days, that it's affecting also people with poor nutrition, then we are like, well, what we have done to our systems and with our policy, we also have threatened our own people. And one of the strategies that I've seen in nutrition, at least, is like they are trying to reteach, but more like at elementary school different ways of doing understanding and going back to the local to the value of the local all right ma'am there is another question from rania in terms of property rights to the land are the producers of meat landowners too are they working on communal lands or are there rich landowners like in india's case that you know, they leases or rents land on the to the other for cultivation. Uh, the answer it's like both. <laughs> uh, in the in the case I was presenting, those were farmers having a communal ownership, so they have to decide collectively or like there's a division internally in the community that this land belongs to you and this land belongs to to your sister, etc but like the whole territory it's owned by the community and most of the decisions for example when this engineer came to the community they had to decide in an in an assembly if 
they accepted him to come and work with them because it was like we can reject or accept our territories and that's when i was mentioning all these land grabbings because people sometimes want to overpass that and ignore that these people can decide in their territories but we also have a, a high number of um, land landlords we could say like people that has a lot a lot of land and most of those lands are the productive ones that have access to irrigation that are in flat areas and that also get most of the credit and the subsidies that the government allocates into agriculture and most of them also do intensive agriculture those farmers are usually located in the north side of mexico because that's the flat area whereas most of these farmers are located in marginal, what we call marginal lands, mountains. You cannot easily put an irrigation system on a mountain or soils that have a, like in arid conditions and things like that. Um, so yeah, that's more or less the distribution. And, and as I mentioned before, I think one of the problems we had with policies, like most of the support has gone specifically to those ones that can do intensive agriculture and not necessarily to these other farmers because they are not considered to be able to contribute to food security let's not call it sovereignty let's call it security okay, there is an, again another question from Proba uh, her question is as maize is consumed in mexico uh, do maize have good amount of nutritional value is it because of uh, its nutritional value maize is consumed so much in mexico yeah it has nutritional value but i would say it's not only about the maize but more about the because i mentioned that it's cultivated in an intercropping system it's also about what are the other crops that you get from the whole system uh i think it's the main crop uh but I, I would say it's more the combination of the different crops. I cannot tell you now that the specific values, but I've seen some studies that tell you that the diversified diets that farmers can get from these systems um, can add highly. Not necessarily linked to maize, but for example, like just describing some of these indigenous systems, there's one group in Canada, I don't recall exactly the name of this indigenous group, but they rely, for example, only on a, a seafood and people feared when they started to do a nutrition analysis that just like relying in just a group of specific foods would make them a have poor diets and the results show that no actually the combination that they had with of this value with 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 or, or the way they cooked it also a, gave them a rich nutrition so i think with the milpa systems it's quite similar and for example if you see the mortality rates and i would link it to health i i that's just an observation when i think of my community uh, many of the old people died after 90 years and we see now that in many of these communities we see more problems of obesity diabetes and other things because also our diets have changed and we are relying less on on, on those traditional foods and more on the industrialized foods all right there is again a question from uh, suman sigda how could uh, conventional agriculture and ecological agriculture coexist on an equal footing can we find compromise solutions how can what the, the first one what was it sorry and agriculture and ecological okay. agriculture yeah. yeah i think they can coexist um yeah, I think there are there, there are some alternatives. For example, there is some contestation on conservation agriculture, but I know because it like the contestation it's been more, for example, on how it's been promoted on a some areas or where where more traditional traditional farming it's a um, preferred. But I think there are some alternatives like this. A, conservation agriculture if you like apply the different elements and you have machinery and so on because it seems to be more friendly with the soil 
uh, but also you could use I don't know I think we like I mentioned uh, with example of the farmers when they got fertilizers I think we need to develop better also like curricula if 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 we believe that still like conventional agriculture uh, needs to coexist let's let me call it more like intensive agriculture but like maybe trying to find other solutions right like maybe trying to find not overusing chemicals or, or or moving into organic fertilizers i don't know i think we need i don't want to sound more like i prefer one type of agriculture over other because i think there's a reason why they they coexisted if we say about the green revolution that it it was terrible around the world i would say it also depends on the context right um so i think again it, it might depend a lot on on what are the the combinations we make and i think one of the things i wanted to convey with the example i was giving is like there are ways in which we can mix traditional knowledge and modern knowledge but we tend in general to undermine the traditional knowledge and maybe we should start looking at those alternatives too uh Thank you, people, sir, for taking over. Uh, during my absence, I really regret the inconvenience caused because of the internet going off. And now I'm back. I think uh, we took a lot of questions, and it was a very good uh, interactive session I had been following. And now I don't think since uh, time provides for a extensive uh, conversation and for taking more questions, we'll keep the questions here for now. Maybe later, if we have time, we can come back to this later. So before going into the valedictory session, I would like to again uh, thank Tanya Martinez once and reflect on today's uh, talk that she delivered and how I somehow could, uh, could relate to whatever uh, the situations you are talking about to our situation here in the farming systems that I have closely witnessed uh, in that of the hills. Uh, from how we can uh, harvest uh, chayotes, the roots, and uh, keeping that aside, how we uh, involve ourselves in how the farmers involve themselves in community part of farming. In your side, you call it the community lad. In the hills of Darjeeling, Sikkim, they call it the farmer system, where farmers they help the other farmers uh, for uh, this cultivation of paddy, maize, and stuff. And this goes on like a turn by system like the entire community they help each other for the for cultivating this uh, crops uh, major crops like paddy maize and all so there was this kind of uh, similarity that i could notice and also about how you talked that uh, the government's uh, provision of food that was getting the agriculture reduced in area so it might not be a very uh, the best of the examples that I could uh, cite, but even in the hills, some studies uh, had brought out this uh, fact that the provision of government schemes, like one of the major uh, employment scheme in India, is the rural employment uh, guarantee scheme. So uh, this uh, the scheme, the provision of the scheme in the hills, on one side was making very positive changes in the earnings and lifestyle of the people but in the other hand it was also discouraging people from working in the agricultural field so that was also uh, somewhere responsible for the reduction of agriculture or the engagement in agriculture in the hills of Darjeeling and Sikkim so I could link some uh, some factors of study in my observations around this place so that was a basic, very positive outcome from whatever uh, lecture or talk you delivered that I could uh, see things through your lens uh, and paint whatever my experience is in the agricultural scenario here through your study. And as, you, as the main point of your lecture or your talk today centered around the problem of food security and food sovereignty, it in fact in India as well is right now a major concern of research or a major point of research because 
uh, people fear that we might head to a point where we might not be food sovereign or food secure despite being such a huge nation with such a great opportunity uh, such great engagement in agriculture so i thank you so much for bringing this issues in light and also as father the principal george thatathil was asking uh, pointing out like it may be important to cite how we got connected to you so dr tanya martinez happens to be a friend of uh, my friend or rather my sister rincho dukpa who connected me to her uh, they were co researchers at dagangan uh, uh, university where both were i guess pursuing their phd so i also thank uh, rincho dukpa my, my friend and my sister uh, to for getting me connected to tanya and as as such we could have such a engaging and such a uh, such a beautiful session today with her so moving ahead we have with us today here uh, professor panakanti basu and uh, our other former speaker i don't i uh, i need to see if she is okay i we also have professor sanjay roy mukherjee here i am very thankful that they could be present here for our final session and i first would like to request professor pranav kanti basu to uh, to honor our session by uh, two minutes of your thoughts how uh, about this entire webinar and your experience with us can you hear me sir So you are muted, sir. Could you unmute yourself? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, Hello. sir. You are audible now. Oh. Yes, okay. sir. You are uh, audible. uh thank you father tarudil thank you biki uh, i'm greatly honored to be invited to the valedictory session and my apologies to professor mukherjee because other engagements prevented me from the other session uh, but i did listen into ms martinez it was uh, very enlightening for me it did connect with some of the things i have to know to my association with some ngos uh, but also i found it very interesting because it links up with something started with uh, in my lecture that the problem with uh, modernity modernization i connected modernization and uh, nationalism uh, through fundamentalism the problems that it creates uh ms martinez the problem of modernization uh vis-a-vis -vis the problem of indigenous uh um, agricultural practices so it all leads to a questioning of this whole paradigm of modernization and i think we have to think it all over again and my submission is that uh, a lot of the ills of our society including the kind of hatred we spew communal hatred is a result of our uh firm faith in modernity though sometimes we uh, are not very conscious of it we think that we are going a different way but basically we are uh it's a kind of a belief that there must be only one way it's a modern uh, it's a progress in there is only one way to follow whereas we forget about pluralism we forget that we uh, no one can decide what is best one else can decide what is best like and as martinez i think the example that uh, a farmer says that my freedom so all these things and uh, thank you for uh, having me uh, as a speaker at your session uh, i'm very grateful to you i hope that Uh, there will be other such sessions and i would love to thank you
thank you professor basu uh, i would also like uh, to invite professor sanchari roy mukherjee to share her thoughts with her in a very brief note thank you biki uh, am i audible yes yes ma'am you are audible okay um so thank you professor basu also uh, i would like to thank uh, father george padatil i think the matters today and uh, i found it very interesting and there were a lot of similarities to the region that we live in right now and uh, biki you are absolutely right there were a lot of similarities with the hill agriculture or the hill farming system that we have here and especially especially because maize is also a major uh, major crop that is grown out here now just just a few words about the webinar where the topic was uh, land and involving communities and all and being an economist the first thing which comes to my mind is that land labor and capital are the three major factors of production that we can think of and the moot point of research is the interface of the communities with these three factors of production now we are talking about land and therefore land is um, land to us actually means wealth land to us means power the 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 uh, the acres of land that a farmer actually owns designates him as a as a large farmer or a medium skill farmer or a small or marginalized farmer in our country and therefore uh, it is very important that you have taken up the issue of land however it is not only land but the land use that we are concerned about unless and until we are the land is being used in a very profitable manner and in a very sustainable manner then only we can think of a sustainable livelihood in agriculture especially and uh, as is the case elsewhere in case of india also people have been moving out of agriculture because agriculture um is still low valued uh, produces low valued crops and um, in fact its its uh, contribution to the gdp is merely 15% in india compared to the industry and the services se sector which is taking off in fact what professor basu was men mentioning regarding traditional and, and uh, mod modernity or modern more modern agriculture you know there is a uh, nice link here there is a linkage between uh, when we when we term countries uh, as less developed economies to developing economies to develop developed nations or developed countries you know so when we more move from less developed to developing you know the terminologies have changed over the years over the decades and we can associate this with primitive agriculture then to traditional agriculture and then to the modern agriculture which is a highly mechanized system but in the process like martin has also referred to the green revolution once in fact i was about thinking about the same thing <clears throat> that green revolution although increased the productivity levels but it had a very diverse it had a very differ differential impact on all the states of india in fact uh, what uh, what i liked uh, what what was very interesting about the technological ethnography that she talked about yes there has to be a community adapt adaptation sorry adaptation of uh, of the technology that is being imposed on them and i'll just uh, i'll just talk about, in fact in the process of green revolution we found that it was mostly the large farmers who, who had benefited and the wheat growing areas and not the rice growing areas like west bengal they, are, they were not as much benefited from from uh, from uh, green revolution and in the process actually we lost so many variety hundreds of variety of paddy you know rice seeds and therefore uh, in fact there is a there is a research going on in north bengal itself from our university where we are trying to get back uh, the seeds that we have lost in some form or the other and hybridization even though it is uh, it increases the productivity but um, in the process the seed bank gets lost okay and we are trying to revive it once again and just on a final note i would just like to give an example of uh, one case of mismatch between the policy 
chief or the or the scheme that was being implemented and and the adaptation at the on the ground and this is uh, this um, this was known as admi accelerated development of minor irrigation which was funded by the dfid now the people sitting there in uk or elsewhere you know they are designing this kind of policies which are to be implemented on the ground in india and the jalpaiguri being one of the one of the backward districts uh, implementation we were holding a project out there also and we came across this problem where the government the, for basically for the government it is important that they spend the funds that they have received and that is a success story that they are going to produce it depends uh, and of course the number of beneficiaries now incidentally this kind of a program which was supposed to provide minor irrigation facilities to the farmers therefore uh, so that they can increase their productivity because uh, in the certain areas which are in uh, selected areas where irrigation was not available now unfortunately or fortunately the the uh, the criteria which was mentioned in the in the program is that the it will be provided uh, there has to be a water users association and uh, or farmers association water users and within that the 30% of the of the members in that association have to be women and the and the uh, caveat that uh, that they had given was that they have to be they have to own their land and therefore the question of owning the land here becomes important in this case that because of the schemes which are implemented sometimes it comes with a baggage that you have to own the land and therefore the money will be available to you now in that water users association it was difficult to include women because women did not hold land and it was very difficult for us to explain to them that it has to be on paper because whenever you are asking these women to hold land are you the owner of land they are saying yes because to them the family owning the land or the head of the household or the man holding holding the land is similar to their holding uh, holding the land because they are working on the field so this was a kind of a mixed match and therefore we had to propose that they let there be a sub committee where we can have the women uh, women as the members and the women would be the wives of the husbands who are the owners of the land so this is one of the reasons why there has to be a technological ethnography and sometimes we miss out on these things and these kind of webinars which brings these topics up and uh, thanks to uh, dr martinus from me for bringing it up and uh, in future if we have some kind of a, uh, some interaction again with the government where uh, in fact uh, i have been uh, uh, over the years of 32 years we i have been lot of linking with the government activities on the ground and therefore we can I think there's some network issue we have to go see here. Yes, I think so. Uh, thank you, Professor, uh, Madam Professor Santhari Roy Mukherjee, for the valuable talk, and thank you for setting a per, uh, setting a perspective on the uh, uh, to the talk for today, the discussion for today. Indeed, today's discussion, I would like to say, has touched all the uh, the topics of all the discussion in the last four days. one by one today's discussion has been related to all the four discussions that we had in the last four days and this uh, makes our session or it makes our webinar uh, a lot more successful in many ways uh, thank you uh, dr tania for your uh, wonderful speech i now would like to welcome uh, mrs srijana sinha uh, faculty member uh, department of geography to share her uh, experience from the faculty member side uh, of from this webinar madam srijana sinha if you are here please you could uh, take the session okay, ma'am you are not audible and yet maybe 
there is some problem with the like yeah you have changed the system uh, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, sir. Yeah. yes yes oh she's here okay okay she is still not audible so we could have uh, so this take over, yeah. uh to take over she is also a faculty member department of geography solution college delivery Miss Bhavana Patik, uh, okay. Please kindly unmute yourself, okay, thank you. Okay, uh, good morning everyone. Uh, yes, uh, talking about all the uh, sessions, like the four day webinar sessions we had, uh, it was very like uh, insightful for us. We gained a lot of knowledge and all the sessions were very good. Like uh, we gained uh, like, uh, lot of insights we gained from the uh, presentations and uh, talking about each presentation like uh, the for the second day of the webinar session like I could personally connect like with the second session which uh, professor Sanchari Roy Mukherjee she gave as I have worked on migration in my PhD but at that point like due to some technical uh, issue I could not hear the whole webinar but I uh, listen to the webinar in the YouTube uh, webinar series. So I, from, from the first till the end, I listened to the whole webinar and I uh, totally agree to the issues uh, she shared with us. And uh, I could relate to the migrants, plight of the migrants workers. And the uh, issue she raised is the, uh, the state and the, the state, the country was not prepared to what the migrants could have done, like the suddenly the lockdown happened and they were not prepared for it. And there was a state and uh, the union clash between the state and the union. So all these things, I absolutely agree to all the points she made about the migrant workers. So uh, it was a very uh, elaborative, very uh, thoughtful session. And uh, secondly, Dr. Kingsbury's presentation, uh, which was very good, like he used all the pictures and visualization. It helped us understand so much about the city of Kofu. Uh, today he's not uh, here with us in this uh, presentation, but uh, uh, how, like he, he explained with the, his pictures how the uh, city of Kofu, it changed through time, like it was a grape growing uh, area grapes was cultivated in the small hill town of Kofu and how he beautifully highlighted the term rural urban and uh, rural the wine tourism wine tourism was an interesting part of the presentation he mentioned how the people they used to come in buses enjoyed in the vineyards and again went back through the same bus so but it is very sad to hear that all this culture does not uh, exist now it has disappeared through time and how a small hill is changing into an urban uh, landscape the small city of Kofu it has changed into an urban landscape and uh, the young uh, the young uh, the people are migrating out for uh, white collar jobs they don't want to do farming anymore so so all these things like it was very interesting uh, session and uh, Dr. Swell Firdosi is also not here with us today. So I would also like to uh, mention like what I uh, gained from it uh, is like what he talked is about the food and the land system giving he gave a detailed explanation using uh, the data sources. So he said how the uh, sectors all the sectors contributed to the GDP of the low income and high income countries and how it varies. Uh, in between the developing and the developed countries. And uh, he also highlighted how the land fragmentation was a major cause of poverty in India, like being an agricultural country. So he gave the overall picture, like why it is important to have uh, uh, knowledge about the food and the land, land system. So uh, lastly, like today's uh, uh, webinar series was also very interesting, ma'am. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, you, your uh, today's presentation was very elaborative, like using pictures. Uh, we could understand it very well, the indigenous food system of uh, Mexico. And uh, what I related, what I could relate it is with the indigenous uh, farming system of uh, 
the northeastern part of india like we do rice uh, cultivation in the india like being an agricultural country like we uh, we grow rice wheat and other uh, pulses and all but like we have a specific food choices like in the northeastern part of india we uh, especially we uh, eat like uh, we are the rice eaters in northeastern part of india and the southern part so like uh, and in also in uh, neighboring countries like nepal and sri lanka so uh, talking about nepal and like northeastern part of india we uh, celebrate like festivals like in the uh, 15th month of uh, the the uh, indigenous to the like the calendar is called the 15th day of the nepali month asar so the community we come together and we celebrate this day as one of the uh, day where we like dress up we you uh, we put the indigenous dress we wear indigenous dresses and then we celebrate and go to the fields and and then we uh, like celebrate this this is also a festival kind of thing the rice cultivation is also a festival kind of thing so uh, what we do is like we perceive that in that day we eat rice and curd okay so uh, even here in our urban places like in our darjeeling and sikkim area so we eat rice and curd in that specific day like we don't live in the like uh, these uh, darjeeling sikkim part urban part so even the urban dwellers also we like remember that day and we celebrate it so indigenous food system like still exist year too and also i would like to uh, mention one more uh, festival that is the mage sakrati i think the other uh, yeah, listeners participants who are from india or this part of the sikkim darjeeling we could relate to this uh, day as this day celebrated as a day where we eat the uh, indigenous like we take uh, this indigenous food the roots whatever you showed in your presentation ma'am the roots uh, you showed in the picture so we also like celebrate that day as a uh, day where we uh, we go and buy these like we in the way like we staying in the urban places like in sikkim valley we go and uh, buy those indigenous food uh, brought from the villages and we we are uh, like make this a uh, roots uh, in our that day specific day that is uh, before the beginning of spring before the beginning of spring we celebrate this day and we eat those indigenous food uh, celebrating this day so these two days like i could relate with my uh, with your presentation whichever you uh, presented today ma'am so it was a very like we could relate it with our country as well in our northern northeastern part of the region so uh, so so these were all my experience and personally being a, a new uh, faculty i recently joined in this uh, selection college so uh, this webinar series like helped me uh, connect with the college and all my fellow colleagues as well so i would like to thank father for his uh, uh, very encouraging like uh, effort so he has always inspired us so uh, thank you father with this i would like to end uh, my experience of this webinar well, series thank you uh, thank you miss uh, bhavana pate for sharing your experience uh, uh, thank you now i would like to invite over uh, father george tatatil to kindly share your valuable view Before uh, the PT, I have already spoken. Is there anyone else who would like to speak from among the students or any of the? Yes, father. Uh, I have a student. Uh, can I ha have a student? Then yes. I can invite him. I, yes, I please, please proceed. Please proceed. proceed. Okay. Yes. I I think one of our students, Ajitya, has prepared. Uh, uh, is uh, excited to share about his experience. And since this entire effort and endeavor was on our part. for the students mainly for our students mainly for them to get exposure to what mainstream economics and what mainstream geography and other uh, disciplines are doing into research so uh, aditya you could uh, kindly share your views and your experience from this webinar are you listening Okay, Vicky sir. Yes. Even uh, our student was willing to share if uh, Priti okay, Parmar. Okay, please. 
he or she is present, if she is there, she could speak. Yes. Yeah. Uh, what's the name, people, sir? Pretty, pretty Parmata. She was uh, there. Okay, she okay. Pretty, kindly, if you are uh, here, you could join in. Please. And unmute Pretty. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. Thank okay, you, sir. Thank you. Okay. Firstly, good morning, everyone attending the webinar. I, Preeti Paramata, of fifth semester Geography Department, Selection College, Siliguri, would like to thank our today's presenter, Dr. Tanya Martinez, for taking her time out and delivering lecture on such an informative and interesting topic. Now, proceeding further, I would like to share a short experience regarding the five-day webinar. So. Attending the webinar has provided all of us with a great learning opportunity and the most interesting part about this webinar was the topics that were very relevant and relatable to the present scenario as a result of which we could understand with a very clear perception. Personally, I like the lectures delivered by Dr. Sohail Firdos and Professor Sanchari Roy Mukherjee uh, on the topics food and land systems and migration and labor crisis respectively. Their lectures provided all of us with an insight to the problems that millions of people are facing in the world due to the current COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, lastly, I would like to thank our department and all the faculties who took pain, who took their time out organizing these sorts of webinar uh, even in time of such limitations where most of us face network and technological issues. So thank you, Father. Thank you, teachers. Thank you, presenters and everyone. Thank you. Okay, Aditya, if you are listening, you could unmute yourself and you could uh, join in. Uh, sorry for the small glitch that I had. So good morning, esteemed speakers, father, principal, father, vice principal, and the faculty and the participants. Few students have the opportunity of attending online classes during the lockdown. Fewer still have webinars and hardly any to interact with research scholars as an undergraduate students. But we, the students of Solution College, had the great experience of all three. Most of the education that we had acquired before the March of this year were confined to the four walls of the classroom, but the five-day webinar conducted by the Department of Economics and the Geography Department in collaboration with IQAC has taught us that knowledge cannot be restrained to the physical classroom. I found the webinar to be an effective learning experience when the interaction with the speaker helped me to think on a broader, broader spectrum. The topic were quite relevant to the present day scenario things and events happening around us every day. As a student of economics, I had a vague and theoretical knowledge about society and how it functions. But after the webinar, I know a lot more about land, labor, community, and how they interact with each other to form a modern day society. I also came to know about the contribution of a migrant worker who forms the backbone of our economy and the factors that led to their migration and also the difficulties they face during the lockdown during the lockdown another topic that i found very interesting was the land use system how land and labor are the crucial part of an agriculture society and food production this was very well explained by an esteemed speaker along with the process of wine production in Japan, which saw a rapid urbanization and technolog technological advancement. The, the webinar was very beneficial. It helped us understand how economics and geography of a place are often so closely related to each other. Though the webinar was revolving around various topics of economics and geography, it was as easily comprehensible to a student of other stream as it was to us, the students of economics and geography, thanks to the environment created by the knowledge and by the knowledgeable and accomplished speakers. Overall, my experience with the webinar was very good, and I thank Father Principal, Father Vice Principal, and the Faculty of Economics and Geography, Depart geography Department for pro providing us with this opportunity. Thank you. 
Father, your voice is not audible properly. It is cracking. Hello, is it better? No, it is. There is a lot of echo. Hello, is it better? Uh, you could continue Hello. further, but uh, it is not as good as. Uh, uh, yes, I am not. I am not disturbing you. Proceed. I just want to say thank you to Aditya. That's all. And the police. Uh, Father, uh, I think it's pretty late uh, for us, I, and I think uh, Tanya's time is also very much uh, uh, in a, since she lives in a very completely diff different time zone. She she is still up for our, our session here, though it's past a bit time, I think. So, Father, could you uh, please place your views and your kind word? Okay, first of all, a very special word of thanks to Professor Sanji Basu and Sanjeevi Roy Mukherjee for having joined us for this kind of a mini valedictory uh, program. Uh, secondly, thank you very much to Vipul and uh, uh, Vicky, uh, head in the departments of geography and uh, uh, economics. Uh, thanks to all the participants and a very special way to Tanya Martinez. Uh, it is, I think, uh, uh, very significant that we uh, learn when we listen to people from totally different contexts. It's just like we appreciate our own language when we learn another language. We uh, appreciate our country when we visit another country and that's literally what has happened by positioning these uh, uh, discussions which are revolving around uh, our own concerns vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, Japan on the one hand and Mexico on the other. So I think this was a very good uh, mode of approach to knowledge. And as the respondents mentioned, and those of us who listened, I'm sure are the luckier and happier for having done so. And I should make a special note of uh, and invite the students, since the talks are available on the YouTube, to go back to the very first talk by Professor Tanti Basu. Why I say so is, you know, between the experimental kind of knowledge that we get, and the theoretical kind of backing of that knowledge, it is always easier to go for the experimental because there are visuals or because there are hard data or there is a statistical analysis, you know, and we need that. But knowledge and critique on knowledge and a perspective on knowledge happens because we are able to position it in a particular frame. And uh, that framing uh, requires theoretical considerations. And that's what the opening speaker of this uh, uh, seminar, uh, webinar gave us by placing community, modernity and the question of alienation. But, you know, I, I, therefore, I hope each of you will go back uh, to listen to it and to take notes from there as well. And I want therefore uh, in a particular way thank Dr. Uh, you Basu know, for having joined us and for having set the tone. And Dutania, as uh, Vicky rightly mentioned, in her presentation, touching on all the previous issues that we dealt with and giving us this wider perspective. Uh, thank you uh, to one and all, and uh, once again, congratulations to the department for having brought these questions to our uh, knowledge frame. Thank you. Uh, as we come to the end of this session, I would uh, like to present my board of thanks. Uh, I would like to thank Dr. Tanya Martinez, first of all, for accepting our in invitation and agreeing to deliver such an interesting and such a fruitful talk uh, at our webinar today. Thank you, ma'am. I would want to express my heartfelt gratitude to Father George Thatafil, Principal of Celestine College and the Chairman of the I IQAC, for always being a source of in uh, inspiration and motivation for us and always uh, encouraging us to pursue our uh, pursue this endeavor. Uh, I would take this opportunity to thank Father Aju Kurian, Vice Principal Salishin College Siliguri and Father George Chappakathinal for uh, Vice Principal of Humanities Salishin College Siliguri for their constant supportive presence uh, behind our back. I would also uh, like to thank the tech team of Salishin College Siliguri for uh, 
keeping themselves on the toes and making sure that uh, our sessions do not uh, our sessions carry out smoothly most importantly i would like to thank all the speakers for all these five days professor pranav kanti basu professor sanchari roy mukherjee professor soil firdos professor aaron kingsbury and today professor uh, dr tanya martinez for uh, deliver, uh, for agreeing to be a part of our webinar and exposing so many uh, topics and uh, so much of knowledge in such limited time of 5 days our students and our uh, our participants have uh, indeed gained a lot from these 5 days of talk i especially thank tanya martinez again for uh, sitting down with us uh, despite her own constraints uh, relating to time and a routine and giving us such a valuable and such a fruitful session today i thank you i thank all the participants who uh, who made sure they, that this endeavor this idea that originated in our college could be successfully uh, executed and without your participation this idea would not have gone anywhere thank you so much i thank all of you for being present here and i hope we keep a touching basis in the days to come in such more uh, sessions and uh, such endeavors that we undertake in the coming days thank you i just want to say thank you for the invitation it was my honor to be here and i hope we can keep interacting because yeah. i know there are many similarities in the context with mexico and um india so thank you and, yeah and the bikini i you did not say the story how both of you met yeah actually tanya happens to be a fellow scholar of my sister they were doing yeah. research together back in university of bangladesh and they remain to be very close friends so it was through her that i got connected to tanya and she agreed to my invitation uh just uh in one request okay so you all remember you all are a thanks as well to your sister yeah brother you are not properly audible actually i couldn't i am saying you therefore all to give a thanks to your sister as well yes father i i will thank her i don't uh, i don't think she is present here right now but i thank her uh, and i will personally thank her uh, for this uh, help that she had ex has extended in making our session fruitful and i'm sure tanya is uh, going to keep in touch with her as well and share her experience about today thank you tanya it was such an honor to have you we are so glad that you could attend and we, we could uh, you could talk with us thank you no thank you thank you, thank you very much thank you. yes people last word for you Yes, father. So, what's the last word from geography? Yes, father. I would uh, be happy provided our uh, uh, participants are there and uh, you do. Actually, I was really interested in uh, you know uh, the lecture today, which Ma'am Tanya shared among us. In fact, you know my research happens to be somewhere in uh, the same area. Of course. not in mexico but other parts of you know uh, not uh, this our eastern himalaya that is uh, lachung valley in north sikkim now sharing that part of story with uh, ma'am tanya the type of you know uh, practices agricultural practices which is there in mexico and which you know is there in the uh, lachung valley there were lots of similarities except for the influences of institution in the, uh, this part of country that is how the uh traditional institutions like jumsa in this particular part of uh, valley lachung valley and uh, you know the government institutions they interfere in the production system that is how or how it was uh, objective was to you know promote organic farming because uh, you know because of which the traditional pattern of you know agricultural system in lachung valley slowly you know it disappeared and uh, you know uh, it, it was you know prom promotion of uh, organic farming led to you know people's dissatisfaction and at the end of the day they you know left their way of cultivation and they shifted their entire occupation 
because of which you know there is a how I could see the institutions play important role in you know making decisions or keeping uh, you know the practices together. This is how I could relate. And other than that, you know, uh, be it a uh, climatic condition or geography, it's of course a mountainous valley in this part of region. It's it, it has very similar you know uh, practices. Be it you said that of a uh, tuber, which is of course a uh, uh, you know uh, a part of you know their uh, food system. Now uh, again. Other part of the story is, you know, the role of, you know, uh, people and the community. In fact, other than overall aspects of uh, our talk, what I could see, what I could observe from uh, this is this talk is, you know, it's up to the people. It is up to the community how they respond to, you know, these uh, processes, and how now in this context here in Lachon Valley, tourism has been very influential in bringing the overall change. The reason for shift in agricultural system is the two influence. Culture, as you know, the occupation which has limited, you know, outcome. Where well, the you know outcome or the uh, profits derived are less because of which there is a threat to the system agricultural practices. And you know the shift towards tertiary or other means of livelihood has been more, which our discussion was you know very much visible in Ma'am Spanya's uh, lecture. Thank you, Ma'am, for being you know with us once again. Again. Yeah, thank you. It was my pleasure, and thank you for sharing some of the uh, local practices in your region too. Is the uh, Swedina back in connection? Since you wanted to say something, is he available now? Any better? I think we could call it a day. Yes, Father. Thank you so much, Father, for encouraging us. Thank you so much, us. Father. I'm just pasting the feedback link. Ah, yeah, please do that. Somewhere asking for the feedback on link for the first day as well. Yeah, yeah I've just pasted it. Thank you. The feedback link for the first day has been pasted. You can uh, check the chat box and fill it up. Okay, thank you, Tanya. I hope you have a very pleasant night and hope you have a very good sleep. Uh, I'm very sorry for keeping you up this late. I am sure it is past midnight now over there. Yeah, it's nearly 2 a.m. So I'm going okay, so to say goodbye for now. But thank you very much. And thank you me. have my email. And yes. Let's be in touch. Yes, surely. Thank uh, you. I'll, thank I'll you. keep in touch and I hope we can host you someday in India if you are around. Yeah, I, I, I hope so too. I've never been there and I would love to visit. Please, please, okay. please. Well, thank you. Thank you, Bye. Ma'am Tanya. Possible we'll go if uh, we can, you know, go for collaborative research work also in future. Okay, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.